Oh, I'm so glad you're with me today. I love these chapters in the Book of Mormon. Some of my all-time favorite, 3rd Nephi 20 to 26. Probably in large part because I love Isaiah. And I'm going to focus a lot on the teachings of Isaiah as the Lord teaches them in 3rd Nephi. And maybe start off with the question is, what do you think about when you hear the word Isaiah? I guess the name Isaiah. I will often take a little poll of my my students and I'll get phrases like, oh, boring, hard to comprehend, oh, impossible. And then we just kind of read that the Savior maybe had a little different opinion. And I know you know these verses, but they're part of our reading this week, so I'm going to start off with them. Chapter 23 of 3 Nephi, after the Savior is quoted a couple chapters, he says, now behold, I say unto you, that ye ought to search these things. Yea, commandment I give unto you, that you search these things diligently. For great are the words of Isaiah. For surely he spake as touching all things concerning my people, which are the house of Israel. Therefore, it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles. And all things that he spake have been and shall be, even according to the words which he spake. I was grateful to be able to spend, uh, I don't want to say the, the work of my life, but I spent quite a bit of time um, on on a commentary on Isaiah. Very, very rewarding and fulfilling for me. And um, I hope that if you've had a chance to read it, that it's blessed your life and your understanding of Isaiah. It's called Isaiah the Prophet's Prophet in a two-volume set. The Savior, as he starts to talk about Isaiah, going back now to 3 Nephi 20, he said, You remember that I spake unto you and said that when... The words of Isaiah should be fulfilled. Behold, they are written, and you have them before you. Therefore, search them. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that when they, these words of Isaiah, shall be fulfilled. I love the when in verse 11 and the then. Okay, you get the when. Hey, when Isaiah's words are fulfilled, then, verse 12. Number one, at the time when Isaiah's words are fulfilled, there will be a fulfilling of the covenant that God has made with Israel. And verse 13, then, adding on, and then, the remnants which have been scattered upon the face of the earth, two things. First, they'll be gathered in from east to west. There's a physical gathering, south to north, and there's a spiritual gathering. They're gathered to the knowledge of the Lord their God who has redeemed them. One of the reasons for this gathering that the Lord gives as he's about to teach Isaiah is very simply, the Father has raised me up unto you first and sent me to, here's the purpose, to bless you. I just love it. I just love that this is the first thing he wants to do is to bless you. And here's how, to turn your you away, or we'd maybe say turn you back to me, but for him, turn you away from your iniquities. Turn you from where you are and back to me. Change your heart back to me. And this, the reason why, is because you are children of the covenant. That's why I'm sent to you, to bring you back. And I'm going to quote Isaiah. I think the Lord is saying, to bless you to turn your heart back to me. And just focusing on that for just a minute, how the words of Isaiah teach that covenant Israel is blessed and how the Lord's going to bless us to turn our hearts back, away from our iniquities, back to him. And one of the first things he quotes from Isaiah is is, um, Isaiah 52, 8, 9. That's quoted four times in the Book of Mormon. And the first thing in verse 8 is that there are watchmen on the tower. And one of the things that blesses us to turn our hearts back to Christ is listen to his spokespeople, his watchmen on the tower. They will turn our hearts back to him and they'll help us be united. Verse, uh, verse, well, it's chapter 20, verse 32, or Isaiah 52, 8. Be united to see that eye to eye. We'll have a voice together in teaching the words of the Savior. And then he has great imagery. I love this verse. One of my all time favorite Isaiah verses. He says, awake, awake. And let me just read the whole verse for verse 36 or Isaiah 52, 1. And then shall be brought to pass that which is written. Here's Isaiah. Awake. Awake. And I love the word again. This is a prophecy referring to us in our day. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments. 
O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no, be, no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. So you have that be united, awake, and then Isaiah says, put on your strength. Put on the strength of your, your spiritual gifts, your spirituality. That's the strength of Zion. Our strength is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have that phrase that, hey, you're going to put on thy beautiful garments. There's kind of a change where you're changing and you put on Christ, that inward change, and it affects outward. You're getting ready to prepare for Jesus Christ. You put on that strength. And you're going to be prepared to shake off the dust, that's symbolic of the worldliness. You're going to shake that off of you. So I, I, I picture it just for me, visually. You're kind of spiritually or you're physically asleep, right? And then you wake up. And then you kind of put on Christ. You put on that strength. And you get clothed, ready to meet him. And you shake off all that wickedness that's on you. And then I love that he says after that, it's arise. So you're already waking up. You're already dressed. You've taken off all the evil. And that's like you shake off the worldliness and rise above what's in the world. You elevate yourself spiritually to prepare yourself to be with God and enables you to, and then he says, sit down. I think there's some symbolism that, you know, think about when we sit down, when does Christ talk about us sitting down? You know, in the fight against wickedness, it's always stand up, put on the full armor of God. But the sitting down one day is when we're prepared to sit down at, a, at the big symbolic meal with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be able to sit with them as heirs with God in his kingdom. And that's kind of alludes to Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. And also to lose those captive bands that sometimes keep us in captivity in Isaiah 52, 1. And I just love that he goes on. Now, and this is kind of cross-reference. This is Moroni 10, 31, where it's quoted again, And awake, arise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Yea, put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, and strengthen, I love this, strengthen your stakes. Enlarge thy borders forever, that thou no more be confounded, that the covenants of the eternal Father, which he hath made to thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Here's why you're doing this, to be able to allow those covenants that God's made with you to be fulfilled. And it's coming back to these covenant ideas. And then you get verse 40 uh, in, in, in chapter 20, where then shall they say, and once again, we're quoting Isaiah, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings unto them. And, you know, this was quoted by Abinadi. This is the question that those, those priests had. Like, what does this mean? Okay, beautiful upon the feet of him that bringeth good tidings unto them, that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings unto them of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. I see in this verse that the Lord is saying that there is ways that the Lord's going to help us, covenant Israel, to turn from our iniquities back to him. And there's several in this verse. Let me just go over some of them together with you. Um, first, we're going to publish peace. We're going to be out there and publishing, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is tidings of goodness. There's implication that What's going to help us turn our hearts from our iniquities is to listen to these, well, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's, I love it. It's the tidings of goodness. And there is a promise in there that, that we will be delivered. And focusing on the promises of the Lord, the promises of the covenant, helps turn our hearts back to him. And there's also that, that note at the very end, I'll go back, thy God reigneth. It's a testimony. God's in charge. And I think that that's part of what we want to remember that helps us to, rem to turn our hearts back is God's got this. We know that. And there is the encouragement that's going to help us to turn from our iniquities back to him. The encouragement that Isaiah says is be clean that, uh, that bear the vessels of the Lord. That's verse 41. The full verse is depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch not that which is unclean. Get rid of that spiritual Babylon. Don't touch it. And go ye out from the midst of her and be ye clean. Depart Babylon. Leave it behind and be clean through Jesus Christ. You are bearing the vessels of the Lord. And you have this promise in verse 42. 
that can also help us remember those covenants and keep us on the covenant path. The Lord will, promises Isaiah, go before you. And the God of Israel shall be your rearward. That's the, the rear backside protection. I love the way it's said in Doctrine and Covenants, section 48, or 84, verse 88. I, God, will go before your face. And it's like, for me, this is one of those things I love to draw on the board. Because Isaiah, for me, as, you, as he's te- being taught, you can visualize him very easily. And this is great to visualize. So, great. You do the, I'll go before your face. So, here's my little stick figure. It's a lot better than I draw on the, on the board if I'm teaching. Get your stick figure and you say, okay, I, the Lord, will go before your face. I don't know how to draw that. So, when I draw it, I draw an L. The Lord's going before you. He's preparing the way. He knows where you're headed. And I love that symbolism. He's, he's anticipating what's going to happen. He also says, verse 88, I, the Lord, will be on your right hand and on your left. So I draw little L's on the right hand and the left hand. It doesn't matter where you're going. God knows where you're going. What choices you make. He's prepared the way. And my spirit shall be in your heart. So I draw a little heart and I draw an S for for spirit or maybe looks like you're super special there. S, I don't know, Superman. But the spirit will be in your heart. And then I love that just visually, mine angels will be round about you to bear you up. We have the presence of angels seen and unseen that are around to help us. The Lord's promised us. And so I'll draw angels. You got angels and kind of draw them all around the board. And I'll do little A's and big A's because there's big angels. I get, I tell them. And, I mean, I don't know. But angels round about us to bear us up. I love that imagery. God's provided the way to help us to be successful. And when you know God has prepared a way and he's with us, it's going to help enable us to stay on that covenant path. In verse 46, Verily, verily, I send you, all these things shall surely come. All these promises that Isaiah has made, the Lord is testifying, will come, even as the Lord hath commanded me. He's just quoted most of Isaiah, or much of Isaiah 52, and these promised what Isaiah is taught here will come to pass. And then he uses that word then again. Shall this covenant, which the Father hath covenanted with his people, be fulfilled? And then Jerusalem shall be inhabited again with my people, and it shall be in the land of their inheritance. And he's like, okay, chapter 21 is a commentary about the Savior. I want to tell you when this is going to happen. Because you're going to look forward to this, and you're going to be like, okay, when is this all going to happen? Here's the sign. Chapter 21, verse 1. And verily I say unto you, I give you a sign. You're going to know when this is going to happen. That you may know the time when these things shall be about to take place. That I shall gather in from the long dispersion, my people, O house of Israel, and shall establish again among them my Zion. Here's the timing when the gathering is going to happen. Skipping down to verse 5. Therefore, when these works, works he's referring to is, hey, what's been recorded in the Book of Mormon. And the works which shall be wrought among you, Nephites, hereafter, you know, you get fourth Nephi. Mormon, Ether, and Moroni, well, not Ether, Mormon, Moroni, shall come forth from the Gentiles when your words are going to come forth from Joseph Smith being translated and coming forth of missionary work unto your seed, remnants of the house of Israel among the Nephites, Lamanites, which shall dwindle in unbelief. Boy, there's so much to unpack in this verse, isn't there? You get the whole history of the rest of the, of the uh, Nephites in one verse. The Book of Mormon is going to be written. Your seed's going to dwindle in unbelief because of iniquity. And it's going to come forth by the hand of the Gentiles. And that's the sign that the gathering is about to come forth. And then adding on verse 7. And when these things shall come to pass, that thy seed shall begin to know these things. Not that they know it, but they begin to know it. It shall be a sign unto them that they may know that the work of the Father hath already commenced unto the fulfilling of the covenant which he hath made unto the people who are of the house of Israel. And in that day, skipping down to verse 9, shall for my sake, I love that, Jesus is saying for my sake, shall the Father work a work. He's going to do this for me to bless all of you, which shall be a great and marvelous work among them. A marvelous work and a wonder, Isaiah prophesies, the restoration of the gospel among us. Back to verse 9, and there shall be among them 
those who will not believe it, although a man shall declare it unto them. But behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand. Therefore, they shall not hurt him, although he shall be marred. And sometimes it's like, hey, he martyred, killed. Look at the, talking about one interpretation of the prophet Joseph Smith. Because of them, those who don't believe. Yet I will heal him. For I will show unto them, those who don't believe, that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. And then he would go to chapter 22, where once again, he is now going to go back and quote Isaiah. And then that which is written by Isaiah is going to happen. And there's some themes in chapter 22 that for me visually I love. Verse 22, he uses very descriptive words, barren. And then in verse uh, and verse 22, also, or chapter 22, verse 1, desolate. Verse 4, ashamed. And verse 11, afflicted. And I think of people who may think of their lives as maybe being barren or desolate. Maybe they're ashamed of something. And that's a tool of Satan. Afflicted, verse 11, tossed with the tempest. Their life is just, it seems like it's totally out of control and not comforted. Isaiah speaks in this chapter for those maybe barren who don't feel like they have a, a legacy children. Those who may feel, you know, desolate that there's no joy in life. That are ashamed that, you know, that there's been difficulties in their life. It's been degrading that there's things that Satan is using against them to put shame in their life. Shame is a tool of Satan. Or afflicted, you know, for whatever it is. Maybe it's you're afflicted with the genetics of your ancestors. Or afflicted with uh, scars, poverty, depression, anxiety, mortal weaknesses, afflictions. In this chapter, God gives encouragement to the barren, to those who feel desolate to those who may feel like they're, they have shame in their life or afflicted with whatever it is. And I just want to summarize the encouragement that Isaiah gives that the Lord quotes. Hey, this is for us if we're feeling this way today. God's encouragement, as, as quoted in, in the second, or third Nephi chapter 22, is God talks about, hey, I want you to start acting in an anticipation of receiving future promises. And he gives us some verbs to help encourage us to act. Expect miracles in our lives. God's going to give them. And he uses this analogy in verse 2 of a tent. And a picture on here is this picture of a Bedouin tent that you can tell. And I'll bring my cursor over here. That you have the tent that can be made larger. You have a lot of extra cloth material on the edges. And so if you want to make this tent bigger... You take these little poles, inner poles, and you stretch them out. And then you put the stakes down in, but you're making your tent bigger. It takes requires a little bit of effort. The tent is there. The tent has enabled to get bigger and bigger, but you just have to do a little bit of your part. So it's back to enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. The five verbs in this verse, enlarge, stretch, stretch forth, spare not, lengthen, strengthen. They're encouraging us and teaching us what we can do to build Zion in our day. President Ezra Taft Benson linked this phrase of, of the stakes to us and, and the church when he said, to members, the term stake is a symbolic expression. Picture in your mind a great tent held up by cords extended to many stakes that are firmly secured in the ground. The prophet likened Latter-day Zion to a great tent encompassing the earth. That tent was supported by cords fastened to stakes. Those stakes, of course, are various geographical organizations spread out over the earth. Presently, Israel is being gathered to the various stakes of Zion. And in my book, I, just, I love this quote from Smith in his New American Commentary. He's talking about these five verbs, and you can tell I just love the five verbs that he does. They encourage us, as as uh, as Smith notes, quote, to be optimistic, to not be short-sighted or pessimistic. 
She, Zion, is not to hold back her imagination and dreaming just how big the tent might be, uh, might need to be. And then I just added in, in my book, as the size of the tent expands, there is a need for stronger cords and stakes to withstand the increased force that wind would have on a larger tent. Zion incur is encouraged to strengthen her stakes, to keep the tent of Zion from being damaged by any external or internal force. In the tent of Zion, I see that we're acting to strengthen each other. And in the tent, there's room for hope. There's room for everyone, for anyone who feels ashamed, confounded, shame, or reproach from that verse. And you go down to verse 7 that God is promising he will give us great and tender mercies. And verse 8, Isaiah is teaching that we will know of God's kindness in our lives. And the promise in verse 10 that there is peace. There's peace with our covenants. Peace comes from our covenants and our strength from our covenants with God. And then a reiteration of that. Hey, not only will you know that peace, but our children will know, I love it, great peace. And in verse 14, the righteous, you are established through those covenants. You are established uh, means in the Hebrew to make firm, to be more stable, to grow or to multiply. And then God encourages us with a promise because we have a heritage associated with our covenant with him. He promises in verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue sh that shall revile against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. I love that phrase. Yes, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And then I go back and I summarize all the things we've just talked about from chapter 22 is the heritage of those who serve the Lord. One of those, those heritages that Isaiah teaches is we will receive future promises. In verse 4, we'll be a part of that tent of Zion. And there's hope for us, especially when we're feeling ashamed, confounded, shame or reproach. The heritage of the servants of the Lord is we will see God's tender mercies. We'll see and feel God's kindnesses. That we will have a covenant with the Lord that will bring us peace and our children will have great peace. And because we're servants of the Lord, part of our heritage is that we're established. Having those covenants with the Lord helps us be more firm, more stable, to be able to grow spiritually and just become stronger in the Lord. Now, I add verse 16, which I kind of skipped over. Behold, I have created the smith. Now, visually, you get the... the uh, Smith that's working working iron and you can kind of pitch them that they have their coals there and they've got their billow and they're blowing the coals of the fire to make it hotter and hotter. That's the imagery that bringeth forth an instrument for his work and I've created the waster to destroy. The Savior quotes this verse, there's 16, in the context of a fulfillment in the last day. And I love the way Brother Lund tied this in with fulfillment and the restoration. He wrote, Joseph, as Joseph Smith, was surely the smith who forged the instrument by which the Lord's people continue to prepare individually and collectively for the Savior's return. And that instrument is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I love that, that verse. This is a promise for our dispensation. The promise that there will be no weapon that is formed against the Lord's servants has been reiterated in our dispensation twice. In section 71, verse 9, and in Doctrine and Covenant section 109, verse 25, Joseph Smith so eloquently said, The standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Persecutions may rage. Mobs may combine. Armies may assemble. Calamity may defame. But the truth of God will go forth nobly, boldly, nobly, and independent. Till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. I love the teachings of Isaiah. I love the, what the Savior did in quoting him. I do believe that Isaiah's words are great. And I invite you to continue studying and searching the words of Isaiah. 
Isaiah is not the only prophet the Lord quotes in 3 Nephi. Now, I'll put this up in, at brothermiller.org in this list if you want a kind of a copy and paste and put it somewhere else. But you can see he quotes Isaiah, but he also quotes Micah and Malachi. And with Malachi, I can see why he quotes Malachi, because the Nephites don't have access to him. And the Lord's saying, this is pretty good stuff. Malachi is, means the messenger of the covenant. And you get that in chapter 24, verse 1. And Isaiah is just te teaching and testifying with an inviting, return unto me, and I will return unto you. Once again, there's a theme of God's covenant. For return back to him, and I'm going to help you any way I can. You get one of the most quoted verses from Malachi. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that ye may have meat in mine house. Now prove me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall be not room enough to receive it. For me, personally, as I read this verse, I know sometimes people like to tell stories about the windows of help heaven and as they're struggling financially and, and they, they pay tithing. And I love the stories. <coughs> Excuse me. But for me, I also love the idea of what a window does. A window allows you to see through into another room or into the outside. It allows light to come in. And I believe this, this principle opens the windows of heaven. That heavenly light can come into our lives that will be more available to receive revelation. For me, that we have maybe a little bit of a peak of what awaits us while we're with God. I love that, that imagery of just that light coming in. And just so you know, Malachi is quoted in all of the four standard works. You have it in Malachi in the Old Testament. Luke chapter 1 quotes it. You have 3 Nephi we just talked about. Doctrine and Covenants section 2 quotes Malachi. And Joseph Smith history quotes Malachi. You may remember there was a night when Joseph Smith is in his bedroom. It's a picture of the kind of the recreation of Joseph's bedroom growing up. And the angel Moroni appears to him on September 21st, 1823. And he, he, the angel Moroni, quotes a bunch of scriptures to Joseph Smith. And a list of them, and I'll, I'll put them in my notes at birthmiller.org. Oliver Cowdery says, hey, here's some of the things that, I, that uh, Moroni quotes to Joseph Smith. And a couple of those that Joseph quotes, or Moroni quotes, and I just underlined it in red, Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, and Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He quotes, and I'm skipping to chapter 4, verse 5, I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreaded day of the Lord. And I always like to say, are we still waiting Jewish belief was that this prophecy would be fulfilled, and it would be fulfilled during their Passover, preparatory to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the second half of the Christian century, uh, second half of the first century, it was a Christian belief that Elijah was, it would be expected and appear shortly before the coming of Jesus Christ to be able to restore families, the purity in which the course of time had become doubtful. And I think about that at Passover time. And when I have an opportunity to do a Passover meal or think of the symbolism of the Passover meal, at the Passover meal, there is always a table set with one plate that is left empty. An extra place is set out for Elijah. The prophecy is that he will come and come at a time of the Passover meal. And so let's keep a place available for Elijah because he's going to come on Passover and indeed, he did come. Elijah came as the Jewish people of faithful were keeping the Passover meal. Elijah came, but maybe not at Passover for dinner, but he came to the Kirtland Temple where he visited Joseph Smith. And part of the keys were restored to him. And now back to Malachi, he shall turn the hearts of the children, hearts of the father to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Joseph Smith translated this. He's like, oh, I just want to maybe just add something. He said, now the word turn here should be translated as bind or seal. President Joseph Fielding, Myth, Joseph Fielding Smith taught, if Elijah had not come, 
we are led to believe that all the work of past ages would have been of little avail. For Lord said the whole earth under such conditions would be utterly wasted at his coming. Therefore his mission was of vast importance to the world. It is not the question of baptism for the dead alone, but also the sealing of the parents and the children to parents, so that there should be a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glories from the beginning now to the end of time. If this seething power were not on earth, then confusion would reign and disorder would take place in order that that day when the Lord shall come. And, of course, this could not be, for all things are governed and controlled by perfect law in the kingdom of God. I love the way President Henry B. Eyring kind of put it all together. Temple work, seething power, covenants when he said, Many of your ancestors died, never having the chance to accept the gospel and receive the blessings and promises you have received. There are more temples across the earth than have ever been. More people in all the world have felt the spirit of Elijah move them to record the identities and facts of their ancestors' lives. There are more resources to search out your ancestors than there have ever been in the history of the world. The Lord has poured out knowledge about how to make that information available worldwide through technology, and a few years ago would have seemed a miracle. When you were baptized, your ancestors looked down on you with hope. Perhaps after centuries, they rejoiced to see one of their descendants make a covenant to find them and to offer them freedom. In your reunion, will you see in their eyes either gratitude or terrible disappointment? Their hearts are bound to you. Their hope is in your hands. You will have more than your own strength as you choose to labor on to find them. I love that. Now, I just add a little bit of a note on teaching Isaiah. I I love Isaiah, and if I could teach it, I'd probably spend a lot of time on it. But the reality is when you teach Isaiah in a classroom or Sunday school, or you don't have enough time to teach it. So maybe I love what the Savior did as he taught Isaiah. He doesn't teach Isaiah sequentially. He reorders things that helps people learn a little bit easier. Let me just give you an example of Isaiah 52 and 3 Nephi. He first quotes Isaiah 52 verses 8, 9, and 10, and then comes back in order 1, 2, 3, 6, and 7. And he quotes it in a very specific order to, as a way of teaching. And if you look, verses 4 and 5, why does he quote it? Why does he skip them? Well, it doesn't really apply. He wants to quote to the Nephites what is going to be best for them. And so, kind of my summary, what I learned in teaching Isaiah from the Savior. One, you know, teach maybe how the prophecies have or will occur. And maybe not so much the order in which Isaiah is presenting them, but, hey, logically, to put them in in a framework of, of what's happening with prophecy. And you know what? There's some verses you're not going to get to that may not apply to your to uh, who you're talking about, your family. Okay, skip them. But the Savior also concluded the chapter teaching about Isaiah with a testimony. I, I know you can't cover it all. Now, one of the things that I also notice is Christ teaches chapter 52, and then he teaches chapter 54. But one of our favorite chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, he skips. And I think, Wait, wait, why did you do that? And I just think maybe there's a lesson on that with there's so much with Isaiah. Maybe Christ, I'm just speculating, hey, that has already been quoted in Mosiah 14. You already have that. It might not have already been recognized. Maybe it's really quoted, so I'm not going to quote that. But I want to teach two doctrinally significant uh, chapters, and they're similar. Teach them together. And even though... Sometimes some of the things in Isaiah may be our favorite. Maybe it's not what we're supposed to teach today. You know, you just can't teach it all. Hey, thanks for spending some time with me, especially as maybe I spend a little bit more time on Isaiah because I love Isaiah. Love your thoughts and and comments, uh, especially with my my YouTube videos. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, brothermiller.org is a great resource to you with uh, videos that just kind of links up there if you want to go back to them. And all the notes, anything I quote in my videos is there with hope because I like to copy and paste and put it in my scriptures. So that's why I put it there. Hey, thanks for spending some time with me. Have a lovely day. Keep smiling.